Welcome, citizens, to Liberty, Tales from the Tower. As your media director, it is my privilege to inform you that the following stories will contain content some listeners will certainly find disturbing. But first, we here at Tower 4 have a few brief but special announcements. Director Yale of the Department of Research and Development is now seeking new and talented individuals to greatly expand the DRD. This after a recent allocation increase the department was approved by the Archon herself. Just how important can these scientific breakthroughs be? What unknown threats lie in wait beyond our walls? Genetic Markers was written by guest author Ben Thompson and read for us by Daniela Jones. can't be right. The world seemed to spin around me, pulling me down into an invisible vortex as I stared at the inexhaustible string of numbers plastered across my desk holographic display. In the darkness of this empty room, with only the soft glow of the display throwing light onto the stacks of manuals and empty meal canisters strewn about my workstation, I truly believe that for a moment I could almost hear my psyche being crushed ever so much further into a twisted black ball of crippling anxiety and misery. Rubbing futilely at bloodshot eyes, I stared in unblinking gaze at the display, somehow trying to telepathically will the numbers into being correct through the sheer force of my barely contained frustration. That, too, was a failure. It was the 11th time I'd processed this sequence. I'd used four different programming languages, consulted a dozen colleagues, and scanned dozens of texts, manuals, and guides during the past 12 weeks. I slept on the floor underneath my workstation, ate meals at my desk, and hadn't seen the light of the sun for what seemed like days. This fucking project had cost me my boyfriend, my sanity, and now it was going to cost me my career. I was in the final year of apprenticeship for my master's mark, with only this vile string of meaningless text standing between me and a half-decent career in the Department of Research and Development. The other students who had come in at the same time as me had already earned their mark and moved on to more meaningful projects, yet here I remained doomed to toil away on data analysis that I was apparently too incompetent to decipher. Maybe I deserved to be relegated to the Waste Disposal Division where I'd undoubtedly spend my days monitoring the pressure levels for other people's shit. If I wasn't competent enough to complete a simple project like this, how could the Archon trust me with anything greater? It was supposed to be a simple analysis, nothing more. A couple months ago, a research team operating deep in the Archon Forsaken Waste had collected a few samples of water from an unattended fringe reservoir, and all I had to do was process the data from the samples, catalog any bacterial or microorganism specimens present, and compile a report on it. I'd project a timeline of six weeks when I presented it to the senior advisor, yet in practice, For some reason, this was an almost unsurmountable task. The data, the data just never came back right. There was always something off about it. There were stories that the team who had performed the sampling had suffered a catastrophe during their excursion to the fringe and that many of the people on the mission did not return. At first, I believed this to be a wild rumor or possibly just my colleagues joking with me, but the more I looked at these numbers, the more I started to believe it to be true. I'd become obsessed with finding the truth, a quest that often distracted me from actually completing the work. But every lead I followed always ended up as a dead end. Cursing underneath my breath, I stretched out. 
flexing unused leg muscles as I rose from my station and dejectedly began the long, cold walk through the dark hallway that separated my bank of research cubes from the ominous office of the senior advisor. Dr. Albeck was there, as she seemingly always was, regardless of the time. The running joke among my colleagues was that she was a vampire. Through the glass window, I could see her sitting at her massive desk, hastily modifying a series of vastly intricate holographic displays. Even in a distracted state, she was so utterly terrifying that I froze in my tracks. I broke into a cold sweat almost immediately. I approached the large steel door, tried my best to collect myself, and knocked twice. She called for me to enter. Enter. I opened the heavy door to a large, cold office, spartanly decorated with scientific models and lit only by the incandescent holograms before her. The dim light threw eerie shadows on her face, highlighting every frown line into an ominous black scar. Behind her, a massive window offered a commanding view of the atrium skyline. Towering buildings jutted up into the darkness of the night sky, looming into the distance like monstrous giants. She said nothing. She just fixed her iron gaze at me, her visage sending chills up my spine and making it hard for me to find my words. It, it, it still isn't working, I blurted, unable to contain my shame and frustration. Still, she said nothing. I don't even think she blinked. Regardless of what I try, the samples just aren't coming back with usable data. Everything is muddled and I, I think the samples may have been corrupted. Dr. Albert curled her lip up in unconcealed disgust. Perhaps you just aren't capable of research. She said coldly before returning back to her ledger. My heart raced with panic. No, senior advisor, I'm truly trying everything. Originally, the samples came back with genetic markers indicating the water had been corrupted with excess amounts of human DNA. I had heard rumors that several members of this expedition did not return alive, but even assuming possible contamination from the scientists killed during the expedition, that would not account for the quantity or consistency of the markers in the sample. Senior advisor, we have eight samples taken from different locations within the same reservoir, and they are all testing with almost equal levels of human genetic material, coupled with what appears to be diatom and dinoflagellate species that we can't fully identify because of the data corruption. I can only assume that. My rambling protestations were cut short by the sharp, loud bang of scientist Albrecht's hand slamming down onto her desk. She looked past her work, her eyes pinpoint blades stabbing out through the darkness at me. I instinctively flinched back like I was about to be slapped. I don't want to hear any more excuses, Castellano. She snarled through her gritted teeth. You've had weeks to work this out. Your deadlines have been reshuffled a dozen times to accommodate your weakness, your inability to perform even a simple data analysis. I no longer possess the patience required to suffer through your unceasing excuses, unprofessional accusations, and outlandish tales. Now if you believe the lab corrupted your samples, you need to get off your ass and discuss it with them. Although I can assure you they will be even less accommodating of your whining than I've been. She held her eyes on me, digging through me like a blade. I was shaking, trying hard not to simply burst into tears. My head was reeling. The world was spinning worse than before, and I staggered backward towards the door, trying to regain my footing. Castellano, I have already informed the division chief that he will have this analysis from our lab by the end of the week. If you fail me, I will do everything in my power to ensure that you spend the rest of your pitiful career scrubbing septic tanks in a sub-basement somewhere. Preferably the fringe. Now get out of my office. I'm finished with you. I swallowed hard, barely able to stand. She went back to her work as though the exchange had never happened. By the time the elevator door closed around me, my nascent tears had already turned to rage. Rage at myself, at the senior advisor, at the spreadsheets, the manuals, the sampling crew, and the lab techs downstairs. For a moment, I was almost glad that most of the assholes who took the samples were never heard from again. I scanned the board and pressed B5, initiating the long descent from my 57th floor office to the depths of sub-basement B5. As the display counted down towards my inevitable confrontation, I set my jaw, straightened my clothes, and steeled myself for war. This was my career, my education, and my future on the line, and not even the founder herself was going to keep me from examining those accursed water samples with my own eyes. 
Absolutely not, Miss Castellano. It's against protocol. Senior Scientist Felix, the night manager of the DNA analysis lab, was a tall, skinny older man. Balding except for random tufts of white hair that seemed to jut out of his head at asymmetric intervals. He moved quickly through the sterile lab, placing meticulously labeled vials of strange colored liquids into well-marked cabinets for storage. Now, if that's all, I'm very busy. I instinctively felt myself turning to leave, as though I was just so ready to accept my powerlessness. I shook it off. Fuck that. No, there's an error in this sample, and it's been corrupted by the presence of excess human DNA. Whoever performed the sampling ruined any chance of meaningful analysis. I demand a new set of numbers. I want to see the sample myself, and I want the access to the reports from the field team that performed the sampling. The man froze. Still in process of straightening up the lab, my words hung in the tense blue-white light of the facility, seemingly echoing out above the hum and buzzing of the lab equipment all around us, and I became very aware of the fact that there was no one else around. Dr. Felix turned slowly and deliberately. In one hand, he held a volumetric flask of blood-red liquid. In the other, a large hooked pair of chemistry forceps that suddenly seemed overly menacing. His face was twisted in an expression that I could not easily decipher. He spoke slowly and chose his words carefully. Miss Castellano, you are in no position to make demands of this lab. He had intentionally avoided the word citizen, and I backed away as he began walking towards me. Do you have any idea how much time and resources go into DNA analysis, Miss Castellano? I oversaw the analysis of your samples personally, and I can assure you that there is nothing wrong with them. I backed up, crashing hard into a lab workstation and rattling beakers and tongs against the stainless steel table. He continued his menacing approach, his slightly uneven eyes barely masking the illusion of sanity. I could smell his breath. Look around you, Miss Castellano. We have thousands of pieces of data that need to be investigated, and all of them are more urgent than reprocessing a glass of water for an apprentice scientist who can't even properly analyze our results. For a moment, neither of us moved. Then, with a smug, self-satisfied sneer, he relaxed backing away in a way that almost looked fringier. He looked and walked over to the cold storage cabinet. It opened with a hiss, billowing white vapor into the room as he placed the red vial on one of the shelves. I released my white-knuckled grip on the edge of the lab table and quickly made my way towards an exit while his back was turned. I pushed out through a heavy pressure-controlled doorway and sped down a dimly lit corridor towards the elevators, only to quickly and horrifyingly realized that this wasn't a hallway I'd been to before. I quickly scanned the signage, trying to get my bearings, desperate to escape this miserable sub-basement. I froze when I saw it. An ordinary-looking security door labeled H2O Sample Storage. The lab had been officially closed for hours. My mark got me down here, but I knew that there was no way I would be able to get this door open without triggering some sort of alarm. I know it was probably not the wisest decision, but all I could think of was my advisor cackling sadistically as she banished me to a lifetime of misery. I wasn't going to let that happen. I had to know. I swiped my hand into the scanner and entered the room. I shut the door quietly behind me and turned to see a large, sterile laboratory storage room lined with glass refrigeration units containing thousands of water samples, each labeled with strings of numbers indicating the samples. Time was of the absolute essence. As I ran from case to case, fumbling through rows of jars in search of a sample I've never seen before in real life, I racked my brain trying to remember the seemingly random sequence of numbers that made up the file name of my data. Fuck! I've stared at this fucking file every single day for months and I can't remember what it's even called. What the fringe is wrong with me? I fucking deserve to be fired! Or arrested? 
or I guess potentially murdered by the creepy night lab tech in the gloomy sub-basement. I was near the back of the water sample room when I heard the distinctive, terrifying sound of a mark being scanned by the reader on the other side of the door. An icy chill ran through my blood as the mechanisms in the door unlocked. I dove behind a cooling unit as the door burst open. I could hear Dr. Felix's voice. She's in here. I know it's her. We can't let her escape. Two sets of footsteps hustled into the room, spreading out. I wiped the sweat from my face, closed my eyes, and took a deep breath. Eight, seven, six, dash, two, three, four. Raw data decoupled. Underscore singletons removed. Version four, final dot SP. The file name that served as a permanent header on my vid monitor for the last weeks of my life was suddenly so clear that I could have told you the font size. I scanned the storage units as the footsteps came closer, counting silently through the numbers until I saw it resting impossibly far on almost the other side of the room, 876-234. My hiding place was untenable. They would find me. I was going to be stopped just meters from a sample I knew would exonerate me. Crouching in the corner, sweating rain, I waited for my opportunity. The footsteps grew closer. I saw a shadow coming around the corner. I could hear breathing. I made my move. I lunged forward, slamming the full force of my body as hard as I could into the division embled on Dr. Felix's teal coat. The old man made a startled noise as he sprawled out, (gasps) crashing hard onto the ground with an unceremonious thump. The other person in the room, a large, muscular security officer, charged forward and shouted for me to stop. Hey! A warning that obviously went unheeded. I sprinted to the refrigeration cabinet, threw it open, and clutched at a small vial labeled... 876-237-3 slash southwest corner. The officer banged his leg into a refrigeration unit and stumbled briefly. Dr. Felix screamed for him to grab me. I instinctively popped the lid off the sample and peered inside. What I saw was clearly no ordinary glass of water, even for something collected in the fringe. Swirling all throughout the water taken from the fringer reservoir was a thick cloud of some kind of strange iridescent golden material that swelled and pulsated with the movement of the vial. It was mesmerizing and beautiful, seemingly possessing a life of its own. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. A phosphorescent cloud of microbial life that was truly alien to behold. Against all my best instincts as a scientist, I impulsively felt an uncontrollable urge to reach my hand in and touch it. When the security officer grabbed me hard by the elbow and jerked me towards him, I acted instinctively, if not intelligently. Panicked and startled, I hurled the vial at him, flashing the mixture up towards his face. Why I did this, I can't be certain, except to say that I believe the microbes themselves might have had something to do with the urges. The officer staggered back releasing me, and uttered one of the most horrible, blood-curdling noises I have ever heard anything produce. He clawed at his face as the glowing golden swarm overtook his flesh. With the consistency of a thick oil, the glowing organism slowly coated his skin, filling into his eyes, mouth, and nose, spreading down through his tactical vest towards the rest of his body. Stumbling blindly, shrieking and howling in agony, the officer clutched his eyes, only to have his hands immediately covered in the thick golden goo as well. He staggered, still shrieking, crashing into a table and falling to his knees. I backed away as he desperately reached his glowing hands out for aid. His blind grasp landed firmly on the bare neck of senior scientist Clovius Felix who was only just now staggering to his feet. Dr. Felix barely flinched as the golden microbial ooze transferred from the officer's hand to Felix's skin, spreading upwards onto his face and down the inside of his coat. Felix hatefully locked his eyes towards me. He knew his fate was already sealed. The microbes devoured his skin and the tissue with unnerving speed, dissolving his cheek and exposing the teeth skull and jawbone on the right side of his face in under a minute. 
Before the last of it overtook him, he slurred out one final admonition. You were only supposed to analyze the sample! I stared emotionlessly back, feeling nothing for his plight. Instead, I did my best to document everything I could about the event I was witnessing. I am a scientist. I am not going to apologize for asking questions. I am not going to ignore significant scientific results. You should not have stood in my way. His lifeless body made a sickening noise as it hit the linoleum. At a room temperature of 18 degrees, it took just under five minutes for the microbial substance to devour all organic material on both men, leaving behind nothing but a pile of bones, teeth, hair, and clothing. The golden color of the sample intensified significantly upon absorbing their genetic material, then reconstituted itself into a viscous, semi-cohesive puddle that could easily be recollected for further analysis. The substance was non-reactive when interacted with by cloth, plastic, glass, or stainless steel, and the mesmerizing effect it initially had seemed to have temporarily subsided. As I headed toward the elevators to depart, I hazarded a glance through the window of the senior advisor's office. Dr. Albrecht was there, still seated at her large, ominous desk, her body dimly lit by the holographic displays while the imposing cityscape loomed large behind her. She clawed frantically at her flesh, digging at her skin with bloody nails, her screams muffled by the large steel door and glass windows, her face contorted into a bone-chilling look of agony. I didn't break my stride on the way to the elevators. After all, I didn't have time to deal with someone who claimed to be finished with me. No, I had an application to submit to the division chief and his staff, and I was very confident that this one was going to leave them speechless. Thank you for listening to the Liberty Podcast. Episode 7, Genetic Markers, was written by special guest Ben Thompson from BadassOfTheWeek.com and was read for us by Daniela Jones, with accompanying voices by Caitlin Statz, Travis Vengroff, and Dave Fenoy. The music and sounds were designed by Careless Juja, and the introduction theme was performed by Brandon Strader. If you would like more information about the world of Atreus, please check out LibertyEndures.com. You can also ask questions at our subreddit, Liberty Endures. To support the Liberty Podcast, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash libertypodcast. Liberty is a Fool and Scholar production, and this episode is trademarked by John Dossinger Publishing 2016. Thank you for listening, and may the Archon watch over you.